Now, we've been moving in and out of restrictions all of this year. Uh, there had been hope that they would be relaxed a bit for Christmas, but of course the hope was dashed yesterday. We can talk now to the Global Chair of Public Health at Edinburgh University, Professor Debbie Schrider. Thank you very much for being uh, on the programme this morning. Uh, on the 25th of November, you tweeted to say, we will pay for our Christmas holidays with January and February lockdowns. Just because you can do something doesn't necessarily mean you should. So was the government wrong to allow Christmas mixing in the first place? Well, I think they were in an impossible situation. Um, you know, you're stuck between what people want to hear, what they want to do, fatigue, as well as what we know scientifically we need to do to suppress this virus. And unfortunately, with the emergence of this new strain, as well as rising prevalence, they were forced into these restrictions. As long as this virus is circulating, it is too risky to allow travel across the country as well as indoor mixing. We already know what will happen. We've seen it over the past couple of months. How concerned should we be about this new variant of the virus? Uh, Matt Hancock saying that it's up to 70% more transmissible. What does that mean for the things that we do to try and keep ourselves safe? Face masks, social distancing, are they all going to be less effective? Well, I think there's three pieces of information scientists are looking for. The first is, is it more infectious? Is it doubling time faster? And it seems like it is. And this is what's really concerning because it's going to become harder to suppress it with our existing tier system. The second is, um, are the health outcomes more severe? Do we see more hospitalizations? And we just don't know that yet. And the third is, could it evade our vaccines if it actually changes quite significantly? And so we don't know that either. It seems like the vaccines are still effective, but this just also shows why suppression is important. The more virus that is circulating, the more chances there are to have different mutations, as well as jumps into different animals across species and back into humans. And then it's harder for us to keep a handle on the situation. This feels to be quite important because it, it seems to me like the government is trying to reassure people that actually the new variant doesn't cause increased mortality, that there's no reason to think it could react differently to the virus. But you're saying that it's too early to know those two things. Yeah, I would say it's too early to say right now. I mean, obviously, they were concerned enough, not all the information is yet public, to want to go into quite harsh restrictions quite quickly. And if we look at Scotland, I mean, Scotland already was running um, a lower um, infection rate, but to go into quite a harsh lockdown over the holiday period to extend the school holidays to really try to get those numbers low. I mean, I think I would hope the rest of the UK would follow that model, which is we got to really crunch this. We got to kind of eliminate as much as possible to the lowest level this virus, because that's how we'll reopen our economy. And that's the lesson from East Asia, from the Pacific countries, from Norway, from Finland. The countries that are keeping a lid on this are doing it by keeping their numbers really low through you know, clear public health guidance and measures. Let's talk about schools. Um, I've seen quite a lot of rumours on Twitter that this new variant has an increased transmission among children. Is that true as far as you're aware? And should we be thinking about closing schools? Well, um, I haven't seen the evidence behind that. I know it has. There have been rumors swirling, which is not helpful. We actually need to have data. But I think this was probably driven by seeing in the ONS surveys how many children and the growing number of infections in kind of children age groups, especially age 12 to 18, but moving down into younger age groups, which we hadn't seen a couple months ago. Schools are really tricky. I think we need to divide kids under 12, which we know generally have not transmitted that well between each other. We haven't seen many outbreaks in nurseries and primary schools and secondary schools where children are very much like adults after age 12 and how we manage those. But schools need to be kept open as much as possible. And the way to do that is to keep our community prevalence low so viruses never even enter the school in the first place. I'm talking about keeping the virus prevalence low. Of course, the tier system, tier three, was I able to really constrain the spread of the virus, the new variant of the virus in Kent. With that in mind, should people in tier four be preparing for the long haul? Are we effectively going to be staying in for tier four until the vaccine's rolled out? Yeah, I mean, I think right now we just need a broader strategy of what to do with this virus. And the more that we've seen about it, we've seen we have to pivot away from a flu model, which is accepting this as a seasonal infection, which is endemic, towards more of a SARS model, where we really just try to keep the numbers as low as possible and use testing, vaccines, treatments to keep a handle on it and try to keep our economy and society going. I think trying to keep kind of low level restrictions for a long period of time is not going to work with this virus. It's too infectious, looks like it's becoming more infectious. And the 
associated hospitalization rate, and it's also younger people. One of the astonishing things looking at the United States is in July, the excess mortality in the age group 25 to 44 was considerably higher because of COVID-19. So it's not like this only affects older people over the age of 80. This can actually hit younger people too. And so this is why when people see these restrictions and think, wow, they're really harsh, this is why they're being introduced because this is a serious problem. Um, it's all pretty gloomy. Let's try and end on a bit of hope vaccine. Uh, Matt Hancock was saying that 350,000 people uh, have received it, that the rate of uh, people getting the vaccine uh, is increasing as well. At what point do you think we may have vaccinated enough vulnerable people to start relaxing the restrictions? Well, the unknown about the vaccine is whether it can stop transmission, so whether someone stops being infectious or whether it just stops severe COVID-19. We know it stops severe COVID-19. We know they're safe, but it's the transmission element that we're missing that could help us really start to release restrictions and develop a strategy for who to vaccinate. But this is the message of hope I would give to people. We are only you know, less than a year into this pandemic, the new virus. We have sequenced it. We have PCR testing. We have rapid testing. We have mass testing. We have antibody testing. We have treatments, which means if someone is in to hospital, you're much more likely to survive. Doctors know how to handle patients better clinically. And we have three, at least three, effective and safe vaccines with Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca. And so looking ahead, in the UK, we are so privileged to live in a rich country, a wealthy country that can access these vaccines, that can do the testing, can do the therapeutics, to have the NHS, because we will be in a good position this spring. By March, next summer, things are going to look much brighter. And what we're going to have to worry about then is the poorer countries who don't have those resources and who will be left behind. OK, thank you so much for being on the programme. Always good to talk. Uh, Debbie Schroeder there.